Okay, it's recording now. All right, uh, Adam, thanks for setting this up. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Dan Houck, Director of Hockey with the Sioux Falls Flyers. Uh, as promised last night <laughs> at the in-person coaches meeting, uh, I told everyone that we would get this PowerPoint up, and I wanted to go take some time and go through it tonight. Um, kind of the first thing that you'll see is, you know, a, a coach's pyramid. Um, really the big thing for us is the, you know, specifically at the peewee and below levels, you know, we're really focusing on the fundamentals, you know, the foundational skills that we talked about at the on ice portion of things. Um, some specific things in here uh, that were mentioned last night include quality repetitions of certain uh, drills that instill habits in the players. And then we talked about speed, uh, power, specifically horsepower, and then technique, which was also a big uh big thing that we spoke on last night as well um, at the on ice session. So, and then as you move up the ladder, you know, things begin to change as you move up in your playing career. There's a lot of different, you know, elements that come into play, um, motivation, emotions, uh, you know, value, heart, uh, identity, stuff like that. So um, at the, the quote at the bottom is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, and the reason why I put it on there is just the general sense that if we're better at what we do than the other team is at destroying what we do, probably nine times out of 10, we're going to be successful. Um, game and practice, having a routine. Kyle spoke on this last night. I, you know, these guys seek structure, whether they kind of act like they don't or not, but giving them structure will help within the culture of your team. And I think, doing things specific around games, pre-game preparation, post-game uh, wrap-up and the such, uh, as well as practice. Having a routine in both those is a really, really good thing. Um, guys understand what the expectation is, and I think it also helps you establish some, uh, you know, a hierarchy within your team, and they know that you're the, the general. Um, practice, you know, a lot of times you'll go and you'll do a drill or you'll see a drill. Um, and you may or may not come back to it. You know, I think, and you'll see this at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, I'm gonna kind of lay out a sample routine or season plan that uh, I've used in the past. Um, doing things over and over again, things that you find are important or that we as an organization value in our players with respect to skills, tactics, systems, and habits um, is a great thing. Uh, Skills or uh, Mondays, you know, for and with the older group of guys, I talked about this last night, you know, the Pee Wee and above or Bantam and above coaches. Uh, we talked about how, how Mondays should be structured. You know, it needs to be hard, competitive, battling, um, a lot of skill work and probably a lot of competing. Um, after that was, you know, I've met with some different coaches already this year at different levels. And, you know, many of our teams are combined at on ice sessions. And I think that uh, after the younger kids leave the skill sessions on Monday, I think it's important to come back and touch on some of those topics. Do the drills need to be the same? Um, and I'll use forward stride because we worked on that and talked about that last night. You know, I would say probably in my drill database mentally, I probably have 15 to 20 forward stride drills that I do um, consistently. I think if you guys had two or three or three or four and you did them on a consistent basis for different areas of skill development, skating, passing, stick handling, shooting, puck protection, um, you would be able to incorporate those in the different, uh, excuse me, stations, um, even in your half ice practice. So keep that in mind that it's just not, a, you know, it's just not ascribed to a Monday skill session. And this also applies for the older coaches as well. Position specific work. Once we really hit the peewee level, you know, I think these guys need to start to understand really some of the nuances of their position. You know, older guys, we worked on driving the net last night, learning how to deposit pucks, um, how to manipulate on the line rush. You know, these are all things that can be broken down in smaller segments. And if you go to the little tab above it in to stations within the team, uh, on a practice night. Um, and then I gave some examples at forward and defense. And if anybody has any questions of drills or things that, you know, you think we should be doing or you should be doing with your players, um, 
with respect to position specific work, I'd be happy to um, provide you with those as well. Thursdays, obviously most teams play on potentially Fridays if it's a tournament Friday, if you're a high school team. Um, but most teams will play either Friday or Saturday. And I think Thursdays needs to really set the tone for the weekend of really kind of the energy and joy that your team's gonna bring into the, into the games. Um, we talked about routine already. Um, one thing this year, you know, given kind of the COVID uh, restrictions um, within uh, the association, and maybe restrictions isn't the nice, isn't the best word, but just given the the fact that younger players can't come into the locker rooms, and you know, our time's limited in the locker rooms, uh, team meetings have rules around them. I think really having the kids understand what they're going to be doing um, before they get on the ice this year is probably going to even be more important. Um, you know, you might want to take the time to physically print out or hand out, uh, you know, eight to 10 drills that you're going to do over the course of the season. I don't think it probably should be any more than that, specifically for the younger guys, older guys, <coughs> maybe a little bit more. Um, but just something that you can add to and that they can kind of use as a database moving forward over the course of the season. Um, uh, you know, I put on here, we did a, a skating drill for 20 minutes at a practice I was, that I ran the other week. Um, you know, the reason why I did that is because these guys need to understand that, you know, in order to go from A to Z that they have to complete A. Like we just don't move from A to B without really being proficient and excellent at A. And I think that's part of the culture that we need to work to create within the, within the program. Um, every night at some point, given the level, <laughs> and it'll vary level to level, the amount of time you spend on skills, but there should be some skill development work every night at practice you know even if you're a high school team and it's thursday before your uh a friday night game and you're going to work on power play power play breakout and maybe some face-off plays you know the first five to ten minutes there should probably should be some type of warm-up that's incorporating skill development in an hour of practice um for the younger teams that are paired together that have, you know, you could have a Pee Wee Blue one and Pee Wee Blue two or two square teams or whatever it may be. I think doing some skill work full ice uh, at least one day a week is the way to go. Um, Mondays we'll get after it up and down the ice for usually the first 30 mi minutes um, for uh, the Pee Wees and Squirt skill sessions. But getting these guys to be comfortable moving up and down the ice, I think is a big part of the game. Um, and, you know, I, I gave some examples here, lines, passing pairs, uh, full ice passing, skating, skating pairs, which essentially means like follow the leader skating drills, um, edge control work, and then, you know, a couple other things here. And I think doing some things as a group to get going is always probably the best way to go. Um, we talked about this, you know, with coaches kind of being the general here, you know, if you have a routine, I think that helps create that culture and then also creates that discipline and structure within your team. Um, one thing I wrote on here is finish to finish. All right. You know, we need to finish what we start. An example would be last night we were doing some 3v3 continuous drill um, and some other drills with the older group and players had to skate out. Um, we talked about in the for the drill to end coach either has to crack the whistle or the players have to score the player has to break the puck out or the guy's got to skate through the blue line like that's how you create discipline on your team not by yelling and screaming um my biggest objective for this meeting is to really create some uh you know synthesis if you will as players move from uh, level to level within within the program. Um, they need to understand all three zones of the game, you know, and that start, starts in squirt, all right, and there needs to be in a, be a beginning and an end. Um, this is really important. Every guy that comes through the association needs to understand that 
there's a concept of me and my teammates versus the other team. When we have it on offense, it's me, the puck, the, the person with the puck, and then the four other guys supporting him. And the same thing applies defensively is there's a player who's initially uh, pressuring the puck and then four guys that are supporting him defensively. How do we define ourselves? Uh, aggressive, physical, compete hard. Um, the concept of 2v1s, this is a concept that goes all the way through mites through high school. 2v1, 2v1, 2v1. You have to understand how to create 2v1s in the game of hockey. You also have to understand what to do when you get a 2v1. <laughs> I, I can't stress this enough. Uh, at the mic, one of the mic coaches asked last night about what they should be kind of talking to guys about on the bench or kind of focusing on in a, in a, in, with respect to feedback in a game for their players. And I talked about like not being self, guys not being selfish on the bench, you know, creating shapes, triangles, boxes to move the puck, puck support, stuff like that. But then this, this concept I would say would be another huge, huge area from, you know, might all the way through, you know, when you hit Pee Wee Bantam, you need to understand when we're going down on a D, what we're really looking to do to exploit the D on the 2v1. At might, it's just the concept of, you know, my partner's probably going to be on the back side and I need to look to move the puck over. Um, puck has no lungs. That means, you know, no matter how fast anybody can skate, the puck always moves faster than it. And the more you move it around, it's the harder you're going to be to, to play against. Um, Well-conditioned, that goes back to the horsepower comments from last night. Territorial means like, gives gives you the sense like people don't want to come in our area corners in front of the net we need to be physical in those areas hunters you know guys that hunt pucks uh really stand out um not just in the program but i think if they move on from the program or to other places getting our younger guys specifically irregardless of the fork checking schema like you know, we're going to talk about what type of forecheck we do as an organization, but that's almost irrelevant. I just, you know, I think focusing on guys that really get after the puck and pursue the puck at the younger levels, and then that kind of comes into, okay, at the older levels, here's the structure of this. It's easier to pull back the reins than it is to inject these guys to go. Let's get them to go, and then if you need to pull back, we can pull back. Um, tough, high compete level, selfless, uh, physical. I think physical is all is often a misconstrued, misconstrued, strewed, uh, word in uh, in contact sports, specifically hockey. Physical to me means you're willing to do things, not only using your body against the other player, but also selflessly using your body to help do things for your team, taking a hit to get a puck out of the zone late in the game, blocking a shot, um, you know, that's physical. You know, it's not just running somebody through the glass. Um, playing in somebody's face all the time, to me, is physical. Um, not getting too intense or boarding. We need to tell a story. I think, you know, when I say – as a coach, you know, the best compliment that you can get is, oh, wow, you guys are really predictable. And the predictability will tell a story in how you coach and how you define your teams and as an organization, really what we're about. So telling a story is a big deal. What do you want to see in how your teams play? Uh, key phrases for the season. So right here goes uh, the first thing that we talk about, you know, uh, we talked about speed, intensity, uh, and power. Um, and then one of my last comments in one of the previous slides was the importance of 2v1 hockey. Move it, keep it, occasional one-on-one -on -one move, shoot to score. 1v1 one hockey doesn't work, 2v1 does. It's that simple. You know, it would be great if all of our players could actually repeat that, that, that general phrase um, because they need to have it ingrained in their mind. Uh, funneling. So funneling is just a general concept. If you draw a circle uh, or, or an oval in between the two blue lines and then run two lines to each post, it, essentially you draw a funnel. And so funneling is just the concept of 
getting pucks and bodies into the net um, where high percentage of the goals are scored. Um, back pressure is a general concept of the player coming back into uh, tracking back uh, as a back checker where he applies pressure from the backside of the player with a puck. So, you know, essentially, if you can picture this in your mind, uh, uh, the, the guy coming back on the puck and the defender who's defending the one-on-one -on -one for your team, that player is the back person back pressuring. And so that's an example of a two-on-one -on -one defensively where you have a back checker coming back on the player with the puck. Um, transition, uh, the definition of transition, you know. I think it's important to know what the words mean. I think it's important to understand the vocabulary. These are words that our guys need to hear. They need to be able to answer. They need to know what strong side is, weak side is, and you know what the middle cylinder is. You know, there's a list that was given in the packet last night of vocabulary that uh, myself and some of the high school coaches did last year. Um, not all those words in there, but, you know, a portion for some of our younger guys. Um, pressure, time and space, support. What is support? You know, what is the difference between supporting the puck, being open, and making yourself available? Um, those are big, big concepts that the kids really need to understand. And, you know, I think it's important that you learn to use these words and then they see visual specific examples of how these things occur uh, in the course of a game. Um, key phrases, um, sorry, I think this is a re, re um, might not be a repeat slide. Oh, no, it's not. Um, passing, this goes back. Puck has no lungs, uh, comment from earlier. First pass on the breakout. So now we talk about in practice breaking up into um, position-specific work for forwards and D. This is a high priority thing. You know, being able to move the puck out of your zone and make the other team go 200 feet to score is a big deal. And that starts on the breakout. And that starts with, you know, your D, your goaltending, your goaltender, communication, getting back, all those things. Being able to move the puck out of your zone. Scoring on the power play, um, I would I would say at the squirt level, we you do not need a defined power play necessarily. They just need to understand the concept of how to create 2v1s on an odd man situation. But a lot of times, the kill will outwork the power play. So that was why that was put on there. Um, D to D to center, you know, rimming the puck is not an example. I put this on here because rimming the puck is not a breakout play. We're not teaching our kids – just to throw it up the wall or throw it up the glass. You know, they need to make a play to move the puck up the ice. Um, getting into the middle, this is one of the things that I talked about with the older coaches last night, but should be a real priority all the way through. Like, these guys need to understand, like, when they're going to attack or they're going to score, and, you know, I'm thinking of, like, a might for uh, 3v3 cross-ice game. Like, you know, hey, just give them the general idea. Like, hey, buddy, like, if you step to the middle of the ice and show them maybe – on the board or point on the ice, like you you would have had a better opportunity to score versus shooting it from the goal line at the net that's along the, the half wall. Um, uh, so that that's a big, big thing. Um, and that also applies defensively is understanding you've got to get <coughs> – my body's going to be between you and the net for you to score. Um, and all these things are set by the, the, the by your practice environment. Um, a plan. So here's kind of a plan that I've used in the past with respect to player development, on ice development. And essentially all that I do is I take on ice uh, objectives, things that are, or patterns um, that I want to see in players play. Uh, and then I create the drills that I want to do based upon those patterns. Um, this, uh, these patterns that we're going to talk about was from, I think, two, I don't even remember what year it was when I started kind of doing this. Um, it was from a while ago. And somebody said to me one time, well, Dan, a lot of what you do really hasn't changed. Um, and no, I, I don't think it really has, just because I think you, you need to possess certain characteristics in order to before you can even think about getting to doing things that are just really 
beyond what we would do at the youth hockey level. Um, so kind of the first thing, this was the first thing we talked about last night at the younger coaches clinic. I think in the five or six or in the six years I've been here, two of the years we've spent time at the coaches clinic on this general concept. Um, I'm not really going to talk a whole, whole lot about it other than the, uh, the picture at the bottom. If you look at where his foot is hitting the floor and then where his knee is in relationship to his toe uh, and his body angle, so the angle that his shin and foot makes, is, we talked about that last night, and then his upper body, chest angle. Getting young players to understand they have to be able to get in this position is a really, really big deal. It's very difficult to do on skates. Uh, if you're gonna be doing off ice workouts with your players, I would start probably with teaching them that just the fundamental way to squat, like, they don't need to do 500 squats wrong. What they need to learn to do is do 10 squats right. Um, and I think those things then translate into on ice. Um, it's far easier to do in your sneakers than it is, um, than it is on your skates. Um, again, knee bend flexion. And then I just put some drills in the things that I like to do with respect to edge control work um, and then off ice, I, I pair every kind of bullet point here with an off ice, uh, off ice drill. Um, stride, <laughs> it's fun. Sorry, I feel like I'm just repeating myself kind of because it, it's ironic that these are priorities and then last night we talked about these things. I'm not really gonna get much, much more into this because we'd spend so much time in, in it um, last night. Uh, Lateral mobility, again, just examples of on ice and off ice drills. And if you ever need examples or videos or clips, just you know, reach out and I'm happy to send you something. Um, passing. Uh, this is one thing we really didn't talk about last night. And you know, I, I've mentioned it a bunch in the PowerPoint, like the puck has no lungs. Like guys really need to understand the body posture that they need to have in order to move the puck. Like if you're standing straight up, you can't create leverage to get over top of the puck and deliver a hard flat tape to tape pass. Um, college teams do stationary passing. USHL teams do stationary passing. Like don't overlook the fundamental pieces of the game at any level within the association. Um, shooting. Uh, Dan Byron asked last night at the coaches clinic of uh, things that that I like to work with on uh, with specifically the squirt players. I do a lot of shooting in um, a lot of the practices when we have two or three teams out there um, because I think that the kids don't get enough time sometimes of learning how to move their feet and shoot the puck. Um, and I, I think this is a really, really big area uh, in the game of hockey now. If you look at a guy like Austin Matthews and his ability to shoot the puck in stride, change the shot angle and things like that. Um, you know, I think this is something that getting kids to understand the stopping on the paint after you shoot. Like if you go to take a wrist shot and you end up in the corner after you're skating straight at the net, like that's a problem. Like that means all your weight's not transferring to the net and then you're not there to get the rebound. Um, and so I'm a big snap the puck guy. Uh, getting these guys how to teaching them at a young age that their feet don't stop moving um, to shoot the puck. Uh, stick handling, again, we talked about this last night. There's an, uh, a stick handling program on the coach's corner. Um, and I also gave some of my thoughts on stick handling. I would stay away from whatever you're doing uh, with respect to stick handling on the ice um, that involves like crazy things that you may see on Instagram or YouTube. I think really fundamentals, learning how to cup, extend, pull, fake, drive, cross your feet and go um, is the way to go. Uh, checking. This is kind of one of the big things, you know, I think that we've actually done a lot better job on um, as a club. I think every coach has really kind of stepped up with respect to body contact and checking, you know, I see even some of the in the, some of the might uh, uh, ADM practices that they're doing drills that involve confrontation, not necessarily physically checking. Um, players when they step into Bantam, you know, it's obviously a jump to go into full like 
all out now checking where open ice hitting is allowed. Um, I think really getting the guys to understand off the ice how they should be. And this goes back to the skating point number one. If you can't bend your knees, you're not going to be very stable um, when it comes in the contact time, whether it's puck possession or checking. And I think getting the guys off the ice to really understand kind of the physics of checking um, and also the body posture of checking it is not a bad idea. I've done different things with teams where they actually even have their pads on off the ice and they work on doing, um, and I'm not talking like linebacker football drills, like I forget what it's called, Montana or whatever it is when two guys run at each other and kill one another. I'm talking about like slowing things down to get these guys comfortable with understanding how their body should work. And then on the ice, like one thing that I didn't mention here is part of checking is angling. Like, you know, doing angling drills and on a consistent basis really helps your team's defensive play and overall schema on the ice. Like learning how to hit is one thing, but learning how to take away guys' time and space is another one. Um, uh, constantly moving your feet. Just, you know, we talked about it with shooting, getting your feet moving all the time, four checking. Um, I have on here establishing a two-man hyper-aggressive four check. Uh, this was from a previous team that I just never took off here. So you guys can kind of push that to the side because I think there's some four check stuff um, at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, we talked about back pressure earlier, um, and there's the definition of it. Uh, transitions, again, the definition uh, it was on the slide earlier. Um, I mentioned keep away in this, you know, getting players to understand that uh, – Anytime they give up the puck, they're going to be playing defense is a, a really big deal um, to them because they want to be able to play offense. I spend a lot of time personally on keep away games because I felt like me as a player, it was something that I was never taught. And I watch players at the higher levels, college pro, and it's really such a defining factor of how much better they are. Um, than players at, you know, the youth or even junior level. They just have just a, such a much higher ability to maintain possession of the puck. So I would encourage 3v3, 4v4, 2v2 keep away games that work on that. Um, offensive zone, funneling, ABC hockey, which is essentially teaching guys to funnel to the net on the rush. That's um, We talked about that with some of the older groups last night. Uh, D zone. Uh, we'll get into D-zone coverage at the end, but to break down D-zone coverage, essentially, you know, at some point you're going to have to play man-to-man -man with a guy. So get, getting players to understand how to play a one-on-one. -on -one. I would say one of my goals for every player coming out of peewee hockey is to understand how to play a 1v1. Uh, I coached peewee a long time ago, and one of my assistant coaches said, we're really bad at 1v1s. And I was like, you know what, he's right. And we're going to spend a lot of time on it. And I think spending a lot of time on 1v1s, but also using them to get guys to understand how to play 1v1s is a big deal. Um, 2v2s, 3v3s, these are things that always happen over the course of the game. Um, breakouts, here's some just, just different breakout options, uh, concepts, and thoughts. Uh, my number one priority area from kind of a tactical and systematic play is breaking the puck out as a coach. I think that uh, if the puck's not in your end, you're going to have a great chance to win the game and having some semblance of order and pride coming out of your zone into the opposing team zone, I think is a great thing um, to set uh, for your team off the right out of the gates for the season. Um, offensive zone play. Uh, you know, this is kind of a tricky thing. One thing that I want to mention here is when the player has – when a player has the puck in the offensive zone in the corner, that forward, the other two forwards have to be working to support him, not by just standing in front of the net. Um, that happens quite a bit where it, it's a chuck from the corner to the front of the net, and it's like, oh, let's hope that he can maybe get that in it. 
really never connects. Penalty kill, okay. Our system, D zone, we play a box in one all the way up through Pee Wee Bantam. Essentially, there's puck in the corner, player in the corner. This is all in the this is all in the uh, Super Bowl Flyers uh, systems book. Uh, one second, right here. Playbook it says 2015, but it's all the same. If you need a copy, let me know. I'm gonna get it uploaded onto uh, the Coach's Corner as well, like I mentioned last night. Box and one, essentially. First player will go hard on the puck. All right, puck's in the corner. First player, usually strong side D. Hard center supports. Uh, weak side D works off the far post to the near post. Toes more south. Head on a swivel. Strong side wing takes away the passing lane to the strong side D. And then weak side wing supports with that uh, shared responsibility in front of the net with the weak side D. Um, you guys will see it. You'll see it drawn out. You'll see it. Um, I'm going to actually open it up for you so you can see it and see what I'm talking about. Oh, I opened it up real quick. There's a picture of Funnel. My artwork's not so great. Um, let's see. In the playbook, here's a, a line rush on uh, ABC, attack break cover. Uh, sorry. Apologize. Offensive concepts. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Box of one. So these are the quadrants in a zone. So we talk about vocabulary and stuff that guys should know. Four quadrants, all right? There's quadrants in the zone. Those are the general general responsibilities. It's not really that stagnant, obviously, but that that's a great thing for kind of young D to understand. And then as you flip this to the next page, it goes over um, the support of the players. So that would be guy on puck, strong side D, center, Weak side D, uh, weak side wing. He would actually be a little lower, but that's fine where he is. Uh, and then strong side wing. And then there's different spots on this then that show where different rotations of the puck. We talked about with the younger teams learning how to, or, or doing this off the ice would be a great way to, to, uh, to teach it. Um, so that's D zone. Breakouts, there's a whole section in here on breakouts. Um, when I talk about breakouts with a team, the words I use are, uh, um, sorry, I just forgot them. Uh, I'll remember them in a minute. But anyway, so breakout, uh, blocking off. So blocking off is the concept of forward skating in the lanes of the oncoming four checkers. We're really, really not so good at this. Uh, this is something that if we focused on, um, would really, really help our teams. And I, I remember the first year after I got out of college, I was with my youth hockey coach running a camper clinic and he, uh, he had his peewee guys working on blocking off on the, on the breakout. Backtracking is how guys come back into the defensive zone. And how they come back in is then obviously going to influence the routes they come in on are going to influence how they then exit. Uh, shoulder checking, you know, learning how to look over both shoulders before addressing a puck. That's something that, like, skill-wise would be a skill thing that you would do very, very many times over the course of the year with both your forwards and D. An example of that would be 10 guys. Guys are two players. Uh, uh, partners are together. They're about 10 to 15 feet off the wall, and player one dumps the puck in, player two skates in, checks off both shoulders, retrieves, gets it on his forehand, moves a hard flat pass up to player who dumped it, and they do that two or three times in a row, then the other player, they then they rotate. 
Um, so that's kind of the breakout stuff. Uh, you'll see a bunch of stuff in the playbook on it. Um, concepts, vocabulary, the breakout. Um, options, bad habits. Oh, pass to the post. Uh, Adam, can you stop this quick? Oh, okay. He's not even still on. All right. Back, you're back on. Thank you. All right. Bad habits. All right. So D retrieves the puck. I'm going to try and show this here. So D retrieves the puck here in the corner. So D gets the puck here. We're on the breakout. All right. D is skating with the puck behind the net, carrying it behind. All right. My dry erase marker is not so great. I'll grab another one here. Our wing is on the wall posted. When this D comes around the net and passes the puck here, everybody in the rink, whether it's the other team or the fans, knows the puck's going there. That is not a great option to be teaching our players. Like, this is something, like, that we can do from a young age all the way up through that if we can get this out of their minds, D carries the puck behind the net and literally is looking only at this guy and just, boom, and passes there would be a huge, huge thing. Chucking the puck up the wall, uh, that obviously that's when a D would just retrieve the puck in the corner and turn and just throw it up the wall or glass. Um, here's some concepts. You know, I'll, you guys can read through these on your own. I, I don't really have a whole, whole lot else to say on other than what's already written. Um, Oh, neutral zone, speed zone. That's kind of the word that I use uh, for the younger kids to get them in the concept of moving the puck fast through that zone. Uh, oh, on here it says uh, kids skating backwards. So that would essentially be like the wings coming through the neutral zone in between the blue lines. So wings coming up here in between the blue lines and centers here in front of them. And the center turns around to receive the puck and goes backwards if they're trying to score on to net down here. That was what I was talking about. Um, lanes on the rink, vocabulary and concepts, dot to wall. So dot to wall, lane one, dot to dot, lane two, dot to wall, lane three. Um, spacing, uh, filling lanes. So as you fill lanes coming out of your zone, so we exit our zone, come out. As we fill coming through the neutral zone, that's going to influence our ability to funnel. So we want to be able to fill all three zones or all three lanes as we enter. Um, zone entry, ABC, you'll see that again in the playbook and that talks on that. I'll let you guys kind of read on that. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it tonight. Um, four check. Uh, I was asked today about our four check. I'm going to grab a different dry erase marker. Um, let's see. Four check, this is in the playbook as well. So puck gets dumped in. Two games. All right. Puck gets dumped in the corner. This is our zone. We're breaking out down here. Or sorry, this is the offensive zone. We're scoring right here on this net. Puck gets dumped in, all right, into the corner. First forward, as they enter the zone, needs to understand that they're F1. So F1 is coming in, cutting the ice in half from the middle out, steering this guy this way. F2 is coming in, sealing the wall. F3 is coming here. So essentially the shape that you create then, so F1 comes middle, out to wall, F2 here, F3 here. We don't want these guys to be stationary. They cannot be completely standing still. They have to be moving a little bit. So we're gonna try and force the play up the wall by cutting the ice in half, all right, and try and ambush in these areas. What you do with your D is obviously up to you. So the shape that we have here is a triangle, all right? Now, say the D throws it to the other side or they move it D to D, all right? This forward is gonna come over and pressure. This forward here is coming all the way across and this forward is coming back and now we have the triangle again in that area. That's all in your, uh, Coach's playbook as well. Um, and that is the one, two, two, four check that I was, that I just drew out. Uh, learning to cut the ice in half, I think is a really big concept. In order to cut the ice in half, you have to have some general idea how to angle. Um, and so 
before you can get to cutting the ice in half, I would spend some time on doing some angling drills with your players. Um, Pre-pinch uh, uh, and reads by the D. Uh, one of the score coaches asked about the four check today, and so that's why I'm kind of spending some time on it. Um, so D, so offensive zone, we're trying to score here. Here's our D. As the puck comes around, or this D sees this coming here, he's got to make a read and get his feet moving in a little bit if you're allowing your D to, to pinch in. Um, oh, 3v2 breakout drill. Okay. Um, I'm going to draw this out. Oh, man. Every dry erase marker, whole box, for some reason, they're all dead. All right. Here we go. So we have three forwards up top here. One two, three, you can get them moving, you can do it stationary. Well, let's just say it's stationary for now. Puck gets dumped in, all right? We have a D and a D kind of at the hash marks. For the younger guys, it's probably easier to do it stagnant, all right? Older team, now this is a half ice practice drill. Puck gets dumped in by coach, first whistle, D, go backwards, open up, work on your habits of retrieving the puck, working as a partner pair to break the puck out. Now kind of second whistle or coaches go, forwards are gonna go. First forward, his job, cut the ice in half. Second forward wall, third guy here. This is three V two down low and you play it out until somebody scores or the D makes a breakout play to coach or you can have a supporting center. You can add a center then to make it three V three. You can make it three V four. That's one thing that I don't know if I've ever talked about is doing outnumbered situations for the players on offense. So when that would mean that the players on offense would have less players than the players on D. The, the concept or the kind of the goal behind that is then in the game, are you ever gonna have to play against four guys down low when you're in the offensive zone with three? No, you would not. Um, and so that's just the general concept of that. Um, all right. Uh, end zone offense, um, playmaking, puck management are obviously big deals, ways to score, feed out, one-timers, traffic, backdoor, um, breakaways. There's probably only like seven or eight ways to score if you really kind of think about it. Um, so those need to be incorporated in what you do in practice. Um, focusing on underhandling the puck when you go to shoot. Uh, Options to build off of in 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 zone end zone offense, um, you know, they need to have some idea of what they're supposed to do. Like, wh what are we trying to do when we get the puck as a group of three forwards and the two D when we get in the offensive zone? Like, they they don't know, and you have to teach them, and like give them some just general concepts. So if you're a squirt coach, hey, when you get the puck in the corner. Look to move it up to your strong side D or uh, move your feet and do crossovers up to the hash mark and then look to tap it off the wall behind you and work on like some of the, the different parts of cycling and, and stuff like that. Um, playing games in practice, I just drew out a sample 3v2 four check drill and then, you know, 3v2 down low, 2v3 down low, there's that situation where it's two forwards then against three defenders down low. That's like very hard for the forwards to have to score. Um, oh, let's see, outnumbering in quadrants. Um, so kind of reason why I put that on there is because what happens in games, if these are the quadrants, so there's the ice and then there's our quadrants here. All right, so what happens is that player will be in the corner here. All right, maybe another player will just stand in front of the net and like this other player is, I don't know, maybe over here on the back door. All right, if they have a D in center in here, we're not outnumbering in this quadrant and this guy right here in front of the net really isn't doing a lot. All right, so 
we have to try and get three guys into this quadrant because they're probably going to have two. And now these three guys have to learn how to play together in that quadrant. So just the concept. So in the D zone coverage uh, part of the playbook, we had the picture of the quadrant. And then now in the offensive side, we're talking about how to outnumber in the quadrant offensively. Um, power play. Uh, as a squirt coach last year, I think I might have spent total in all the practices last year. I think I might have spent maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes total in the whole season on the power play. Um, I just really kind of taught them how to set up the overload, uh, and that was really it. And then, then I let them try to figure out what they were going to do. Um, and what they figured out at the squirt level, so on the overload, we gained possession. All right, so we have a guy on the corner, guy on the half wall, and a player up top. So when I work with them on it, I just kind of came here as coach, and I got these guys to work a give and go or a give, and then this guy come up. and just try and do something here off of this to 2v1 this defender. All right, but what, what, but what they really figured out that I liked is that they moved it up here, and this guy would come here. And this guy would go to the net, and this guy would go to the net, and we already had a guy in front of the net. And then, so, guy comes out of the corner, guy comes off the wall, puck got moved up to the D. If this D had a lane, all he would do is just shoot it through. And now we have three guys in front of the net, and we score. Like, I didn't teach them that. Like, they figured that out on their own just by kind of learning how to move the puck around here, which you can teach through keep away games and the such. Um, and it was pretty cool to watch. So that's just the general setup of the power play. Uh, I would say at the peewee level, you probably need to have really some sense of how to hop it around at the squirt level, maybe just understanding even to go there. Um, but essentially, if you move the puck, good things are going to happen. Um, oh, it's just... Uh, penalty kill, uh, pretty standard box uh, for all the teams that are uh, Pee Wee Bantam below, just a box and pressure, you know. Um, I think at the older levels, teaching your guys to really how to hound the puck and pressure the puck and over pursue, like if you watch an NHL game now, like they don't stay in a box and contain. They just send three guys into a corner to pressure. So might be something that you want to think about doing as an older level coach uh, in, in the program, you know, potentially ban them through high school and lady flyers. Um, that's, that's really kind of all I had uh, for tonight. Um, I guess if anybody has any questions, feedback or concerns, feel free to reach out. I appreciate again, everybody coming last night. Uh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to a great season.